Hello, everybody. I'm Jo, and this is Caroline. Um, so today's presentation, um, as Angela said, is um, recorded. So if you have to leave um, for whatever reason, don't worry, don't rush. We certainly don't want you falling during our presentation. <laughs> and um, it will be available for recording on our website. So I'm going to um, switch over to uh, the slides uh, just to sort of get going on this and then off we go. Okay, so let me, um, let me do something. All right, so hello and welcome. My name is Joe Reader, and along with me today is my colleague Caroline Merva, and we provide outpatient physical therapy services in patients' homes. So physical therapy at ACAC at Home Clinic started in March this year, and our goal is to provide one-on-one -on -one therapy in patients' homes, either as that complete outpatient rehabilitation program or as a bridge from the hospital or even home health into the physical therapy clinics. Both Caroline and myself are board certified geriatric clinical specialists, and we're excited to share our knowledge today on a topic that's near and dear to our hearts, falls, and more importantly, how to prevent them. So um, what we're going to do is talk about the impact of falls on older adults and some of the fall risk factors and how you might be able to decrease your risk of falls and how to make your home safer, and how your healthcare team, and particularly physical therapy, can help you. I'm going to turn it over to Caroline for the first part of the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. First, we wanted to make you very aware of the statistics. I got it turned right open. It's stuck in here. If you could mute yourselves so that everyone is able to hear us during the presentation, that would be greatly appreciated. Perfect. All right. There we go. I think we've got that fixed. Um, so. We wanted to start out the presentation by making you aware of some statistics that are related yeah. to falls. Most importantly, is that you are not the only person that may know I something. Click on it, it goes right back up. You are muted. No, I'm not muted. I've got it turned up. Ma'am, the mute is for us not to be able to hear you. There we go. All right. Um, so 3 million older adults are treated every year in the ER related to fall injuries. You can see- I mute my audio with alternate or press and hold. Oh. Yeah. Um, falls cost an average of fifty billion dollars a year. They're unmuted. In, in specific, I hear here it. it's Virginia, going green, but I don't hear. It. Specifically, here in Virginia, twenty-five point three percent of older adults have experienced a fall. Specifically, um, for the national average, which is twenty-eight thousand, we are or twenty-eight percent. Um, we are less than the national average in Virginia, which is good, but not great. Still knowing that a quarter of older adults are falling. And then you can see the very last statistic there, 69 people out of 100,000 have experienced deadly falls in a year. This statistic is only rising um, and doesn't show any signs of slowing. Strong 
All right. Here is a breakdown of the cost that occurs after a fall within the hospital stay. That's only things that we're able to capture, though. So after a fall, expenses related to other family members, friends, anything within the home that can uh, cost money. Um, and it's really expensive to experience a fall. You can see even the changes that are predicted for um, nine years from now in 2030, it's expected to continue to increase with death rates increasing 30% from 2007 to 2016. These graphics are available for you on the STEADY website. Um, that will be linked at the end of our presentation. They're very interesting to review over to see uh, more closely and take your time to study them um, when you're able to in your free time. Here's another breakdown of the expenses related to falls. In this slide specifically, I want you to focus on what the state of Virginia is spending on individuals that fall every year. There is a lot of capital letters there because it is a lot of money uh, from not only our state, uh, but from Medicare and Medicaid, and then equally out of individuals' pockets, $155 million out of your own pocket if you experience a fall collectively um, is not something we want to uh, endure ourselves, um, but also for people that are the non-fallers. Uh, anybody in the community, like I said earlier, that has family, friends, um, just the population in general experiences this. Another graphic from the study uh, that shows individuals that are most likely to fall. Unfortunately, women are the gender that is most likely to experience a fall over men. And then in the red there, you can see our likelihood increases with age at 85 year old plus at 34% of a risk for falling. And then lastly, it breaks down by ethnicity uh, with American Indian and Alaskan natives at the highest risk for falling. This questionnaire we placed, we're going to spend just a couple of minutes for you to read through and think about if any of these five questions apply to you. This is a quick screen to know if you need to discuss falling with your doctor or reach out for physical therapy uh, assessment um, to improve your balance and strength. So the first question is, do you know someone who has suffered from a fall? Did any of those people have life-changing issues as a result of a fall? Are you afraid of falling? Have you suffered from a fall? Have you had any life-changing issues as a result of a fall? Again, especially if three, four, or five are a yes, it may be appropriate for you to seek physical therapy services. Throughout the slideshow, we have a couple of facts that we wanted to share with you, uh, true or false questions. Um, so first, a fall is not only if you hit the ground. In a few slides, I will give some pictures of various slides that are also considered falls. This gentleman obviously hit the ground, um, but running into a wall or you know, descending quickly into a chair, if it's uncontrolled, may be a fall. Here are the specific definitions of a fall. It is an event that leads to an unplanned, unexpected contact with a support surface. 
So like I just mentioned, a wall, a chair, the car, anything that catches you, this would be a fall. It is not a fall if you are pushed or shoved or a medical event such as fainting, suffering from a stroke or a heart attack. It's especially important for you to count all those near falls a lot of my patients tell me about because it may truly have been a fall. Those are times that you may have prevented hitting the ground but still may need assessment and intervention to help improve your ability to avoid a more injurious fall later in the future. I'm gonna read out the definitions from this slide as the um, font is a little small for people, um, but this is the graphic that I was talking about describing the types of falls that you um, can even grade in this Hopkins grading scale. Grade one is a slip, trip, or a loss of balance. You did not hit the ground or a lower level, um, but your balance was definitely affected. You have a grade two fall if you fell to the ground or a lower level, but you did not seek medical attention. You might have gotten back up and kept on going. Grade three is the same fall to the ground or a lower level, but does require medical attention, but not admission to the hospital. So it's in the middle there. You might have gone for some uh, pain or bruising a couple of days later, had an x-ray done, but your general practitioner sent you home uh, with rest, ice, and maybe some pain medication. And the last fall would require admission to the hospital. We certainly don't want to see any of these happen, um, but can happen frequently, like the statistics in the first few slides showed. Here are a list of physical consequences from a fall that a lot of older adults experience and the percentage that we see happening in the older population. You can see at the top is hip fracture. This is a very scary and um, sometimes deadly consequence of a fall, 37.9%. Most severely uh, hip fracture um, happens from a fall and other injuries as well. Um, however, moderately from a fall, you can experience just loss of mobility, loss of independence when family recognizes that a fall is occurring more frequently than they would like if they want you to move from where you live or ha have more assistance in the home. Fall can lead to depression, arm injuries, and even death at times. Something that we see commonly in older adults and anyone in general that experiences mobility issues um, that us as physical therapists look for is people's confidence. When you are afraid of falling, it is a major concern that can lead to more falls even if you remain cautious and careful throughout your daily life. These two questions here can just give us some insight into your confidence and your assurance with the mobility tasks that you do throughout the day. Um, when you are fearful or cautious and moving more slowly, it can actually increase your risk of falling. One thing that Joe and I can test for with gait speed, older adults uh, believe that they may want to walk slower or should walk slower. And a lot of individuals encourage that. However, walking fast and being able to keep up with people around you or the requirements of walking down the aisle in the grocery store or crossing the street, it's important to maintain your gait speed to get from point A to point B. So having confidence with those abilities and walking and moving and 
transferring is really important. So if you are afraid of falling, it may be important for you to reach out to have a physical therapy assessment. Here's a quick graphic regarding the cycle of falling. You may experience a fall or have fear of falling starting over on the right hand side of your screen. Then you limit yourself and your mobility, which causes decreased tolerance and activity endurance. Then you have increased weakness and the cycle continues and continues. Unless you seek help from your doctor or other healthcare professionals to kind of break this cycle and um, improve your strength and balance. Here are some side effects or uh, breakdown from that last slide that you may have heard the adage, you don't use it, you lose it. Well, that can happen after a fall and in a bigger picture than you may think. So not just um, your muscles, but your activity as well. If you don't walk, you may not be able to walk. If you can't get out of your chair, you may not be able to get out of your chair later. So you may stop doing activities after a fall that you enjoy doing. You may stop coming to the gym or stop going to the grocery store or even use the scooter at the grocery store because you had a fall. Then your legs will get weaker with less activity and it could lead to being at home more, um, not getting out and doing the things that you like doing, uh, increasing your risk for falling in the future. We have another fact coming up. Falls are part of a normal part of aging. This is false. As you can see our graphic at the bottom there, all of these people are on their feet and steady. It is not a normal part of aging to experience a fall. Um, and we hope that we can help you to prevent them. I'm gonna hand it back to Joe for the next couple of slides. Thank you, Caroline. So what can we do about this? So falls are actually largely preventable with some simple measures. Falls should not be, or oh, sorry, falls are often experienced by older adults. But, and managing your risk of falls is a normal part of aging. I want to repeat that. Managing a risk of falls is a normal part of aging. However, as Caroline said earlier, falls themselves are not a normal part of aging. So let's look at what we can do about this. There are two types of fall risk factors. They're the modifiable, and the non-modifiable. Non-modifiable risk factors are the ones that you can't easily change. And as we learned earlier in the presentation, um, as we get older, we have an increased risk of falling. And unfortunately, the women of us, we tend to have an increased risk of falling. And once you've had a fall, you can't change that. But there are very a great deal of modifiable risk factors that we can work on together to try and decrease your risk of falls. For example, weakness. Caroline's already mentioned about if you don't use it, you lose it. If you have difficulty with your walking or feel off balance for whatever reason, certain medications can increase your risk of falling. If you have difficulty with your vision, or your feet hurt, or perhaps your home isn't quite as safe as it could be. Many of these modifiable risk factors can be changed very easily with a few simple lifestyle changes. So why don't we look at a few more of these? So the first thing is very important to know what your risk factors are. The Center of Disease Control has a wonderful um, program called the STEADY, which actually stands for Stopping Elderly Accidents, Deaths and Injuries, which sounds awfully serious to me. So we'll use STEADY because if you're steady, you're less likely to fall. 
So um, at the end of the program, there will be a link to this. And one of the items that are on there is this um, brochure where you can actually conduct your own full risk screen. The other way you could do it is actually have a physical therapist conduct that for you. And at ACAC at home, we're able to come out to your house to do a full risk screening, or you can come into the clinic and we can um, screen you in the clinic to see how, where your issues are and how best we can help you. This is an example of what the, uh, the screen is on the CDC website. I'm not going to read each individual item. And again, I will provide you with the link to this at the end of the presentation. So how can you prevent a fall? Let's look at the, um, the four major ways that you can do this. What is really important is this is a bit of a moving target. You need to check your risk early and often. Don't wait for a fall to occur before you start thinking about, are you at risk? You need to address immediately any factors that you think might place you at risk of falling. Remember, don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. And particularly if you have a change in um, your mobility or something um, change in your healthcare, um, you've had been sick or something, that's a really good time to be thinking about, am I slightly more at risk of falling? And that's when it's great to think about consulting a physical therapist. So let's have a look at medications. Some medications can increase your risk for falling. So it's very important that you discuss all your medications with your doctor or with your pharmacist. It's a really good idea to develop a good relationship with your pharmacist. I know that's a bit hard if you have um, mail in medications, but if you do go to a local pharmacy, get to know who your pharmacist is. It's very important that you can follow all the instructions that are provided on your medication label. So if you have difficulty with reading labels, then the pharmacist can print out the label a little bit larger for you. Following the instructions is important because there are certain medications, if you don't take them in the correct way, for instance, with food, can make you feel a little bit more dizzy or lightheaded. And so, um, again, putting you at risk of falls. Don't take any medications without checking with your doctor or your pharmacist first. This does include over-the-counter medications. There are a certain number of medications that can work with your prescribed meds and um, increase your symptoms and risk for falls. So, and as also as we age, unfortunately, we do tend to react a little bit more to some of those medications. So really important, this is an easy thing to look at straight away. We can all benefit from sitting less and moving more, but exercise doesn't have to be jumping jacks and sweating. I hate sweating when I exercise. Some people love it. Me, I can't bear the thought of getting sweaty. So how do I get to keep my balance and keep strong without doing that? Just know that any activity can help. Maybe a little bit of gardening, walking to your mailbox instead of riding your car there or picking it up when you're um, out running errands anyway. When you go to the grocery store, why don't you try and park a few uh, parking spaces further away than you normally do. That's just adding on a few extra minutes of walking. Physical therapists, of course, specialize in improving function and balance. And ACAC at home can actually come and design a program for you in your home that fits your lifestyle. So you don't actually need to think that you're doing formal exercise because we're kind of incorporated into your day-to-day -day activity. Or you might want to consider going to the physical therapy clinic where they can teach you how to exercise. And some people actually prefer to be in a clinic and work with other um, people rather than having everything occur in their own homes. You could also consider joining an exercise class. 
Um, there's plenty of classes that are available either at the center or at other uh, places around town. Be sure to make sure that this exercise is designed for somebody um, with your particular needs. So if you feel that you're having a problem with balance, you want to look for a balanced type of class. You might want to consider starting with um, an individualized program with a physical therapist first and then going into um, an exercise program once you've kind of got an understanding of some of the moves. It really helps if you try and go with somebody. You can keep yourself true and honest. And even if you don't feel like it, maybe you won't want to let your friend down um, if you don't go. If it works for you though, it's right for you. But don't give up if it just doesn't feel right to start off with. Give it a little bit of a try. You know, everything takes a little bit longer to get more comfortable with. What about your eyes? Unfortunately, certain eye conditions can also increase your risk for falling. For example, glaucoma, macular degeneration, and cataracts. And it's really important to optimize your eye health. So first of all, making sure that you go for those yearly eye exams. And if you do have a change in your eyeglasses prescription, know that it sometimes takes a little bit of a longer time to get used to that, especially if you're switching into bifocals or even trifocals. So the first time you're wearing those, I strongly recommend you maybe have somebody help you walk around for a while. I remember the first time I switched to bifocals, I fell up my stairs and that was um, under the age of 50. So it can happen to anybody. Cataracts, um, um, obviously cause your vision, sorry, your vision to be blurry. But once you have them removed, there is a period of adjustment to having this updated vision. So again, be aware that cataracts can increase your risk for falling, but initially you're going to feel a little bit discombobulated um, after you've had the surgery. If you have a railing on the stairs, and you are a little bit worried about your vision, use that railing, use that extra sense of touch to help you um, as you navigate around um, places, especially if you're unfamiliar. And it's very important that you have night lights in your hallways and in your bathroom, especially if you have to get up at night. So you make sure you've really got good light wherever you're going. What about your feet? Unfortunately, as we get older, um, everything tends to sag. We have a lovely saying in England, which is um, everything goes pear-shaped. So everything kind of heads south. And so that occurs at our feet as well. And so as tempting as it is to wear those sloppy slippers, it's really important in your house that you wear good soled shoes. You might find that you have to have a special pair of house shoes so you don't walk the dirt into your house, but don't be tempted to go into your, your slippers. So you, um, how are you going to get those shoes on when you can just easily slide into those slippers? Well, you might want to consider something like elastic shoelaces so you can get them on easier. But if you're still having difficulty reaching your shoes or reaching your feet, because somehow as we get older, we find our arms get shorter, don't they? And we can't reach down to our feet anymore. Ask your physical therapist to recommend some um, aids to help you get the shoes on, such as a long handled shoe horn or a sock aid or a shoe aid. Um, I know we all like to walk around in our heels, well, certainly the ladies, um, but really they're not quite so safe and a good pair of supportive shoes is definitely the way to go. <clears throat> so um, let's switch into how you might be able to change your environment, your home. We have some questions here again. So I want you to look at the screen as I read them. Have I fallen at home repeatedly? Do I regularly encounter difficulties in one area of my home? Is there a part of my home I cannot access safely? Do I need special assistance in one or more areas of my home? Have I even considered moving because areas of my home don't feel safe anymore? 
If you answer yes to any of these, then your home might be increasing your risk for falling. And it might be a good idea to consider some simple changes. Or again, asking a therapist to come out to your house and they can do an at-home safety assessment um, and discuss with you areas where you might be able to make some very simple changes and direct you to um, ways to do that so you can continue to be safe in your own home and remain in your own home. Just like with that full risk assessment on that CDC website, there is another checklist that you can reference. But again, if you'd like that one-on-one -on -one, um, therapist coming out and doing this, this is something that Caroline and myself are very happy to do. What we're gonna do today now is quickly run through various areas of your house so you can be thinking about that. So let's start at the front door. When you're approaching your front door or your back door, whichever way you go into your house, do you have uneven paving slabs? Is there a lot of vegetation that may be obscuring the path and making it unsafe for you to pass through? Do you have steps up to that front door or your back door? Is there a rail all the way? So often we find that the rail starts halfway up or starts at the bottom and doesn't continue. And it's that last step that often is the tricky one. Do you have an outdoor light? The type of light which we love for people to have is one that automatically comes on as you approach the front door. So if you're coming in at dusk, and unfortunately it's getting darker and darker now in the evenings, um, that light will come on and shine your way. It's also really important to have an emergency exit plan. I remember when my children were young and we were in, um, in kindergarten, they all used to come home with that project. Where are the ways that we can get out of the house? Well, that same thing applies whether you've got children or you're um, now at the age you are today, you need to know an emergency exit plan and is that as safe as the one that you currently use? What about stairs and steps? I don't know about you all, but I pile stuff on the last two steps of my stairs and expect the stair fairy to take them upstairs for me. Well, must be on strike in my house because those papers and shoes and books tend to stay there. And of course, they become a trip hazard. Do you have a light at the top and the bottom of the stairs? You need to light your way up to the stairs when you're going up and you need to light your way as you come down the stairs. If you have a carpet on your stairs, has it become a little bit loose? Does it need to be reattached? And again, making sure that you have a secure handrail that is the full length of the stairs. One of the things Caroline and I see a lot is that top step, that rail ends, and then how do you navigate that very last step to get safely onto your landing? Let's talk about the floors. When you walk through a room, do you have to navigate around furniture? Especially those of you who are perhaps using a walker. Do you sometimes have to turn sideways or wiggle that walker around? That puts you a little bit more at risk. Do you have rugs on the floor? Now I know we all love the rugs on our floors. They keep our feet warm. But I tell you, those walker wheels or your toes can easily catch on those. And before you know it, you might be um, having a fall. If you like to store books and shoes and papers next to your favorite reading chair, that again can be a problem for falling. So maybe think about putting a, chair, a basket by the side of your chair or even a table. Do you have extension cords running all over the place that you can get caught up in as you walk around? If we go into your kitchen, do you tend to store things on high shelves that are hard to reach? And then you decide to stand on an unsteady stool or a kitchen chair to get them. Make sure you've got a nice sturdy step stool with maybe a railing. Have you recently done a Costco shop and left all those piles of toilet paper and bottles of water on the floor and all of a sudden you haven't got room to navigate around your kitchen? Can you safely reach into your oven or your microwave and pull out that nice pot roast that you've made for your Sunday lunch. 
My mother in England recently moved into a senior living community. She's five foot four, pretty active lady. There was no way she could reach into her microwave that was above her head height. So we had to move that microwave down and put it on the counter so she could safely use it. If you like to do a lot of food prep in your kitchen and your legs are getting tired and they might feel a little bit weak, then maybe you could have a stool that you could sit on to do your food preparation safely. What about your bedroom? Can you easily reach the light from the bed? There's all sorts of wonderful new technology we can use for that. Of course, there's Alexa. Alexa, turn the light on. Or can you clap your hands and turn your light on? Is your bed high and hard to get in and out of? Do you have to have a stepladder to get in and out of your bed? Can you safely reach your bathroom from your bed? Unfortunately, as we all get older, we all have to make those nighttime trips. So make sure you've got a nice clear pathway from your bed to the bathroom. And again, remembering walking in the dark at night isn't super safe. So maybe consider a, a nightlight into the bathroom. And then once you're in the bathroom, can you safely get on and off the toilet? Or do you tend to pull on the toilet roll holder or the towel rail? Is your tub floor or your shower floor slippery? Can you get into the tub or the shower easily? Or once again, do you use that towel rail and hope it's gonna hold your weight? And can you stand in your shower and safely reach everything you need without feeling loss of balance, especially when you've got that lovely warm water pouring over you and that shampoo in your, in your eyes? Those are just a few of the examples of ways that your home can be very easily changed. You don't have to move. And again, remember that if it's something you will feel worried about in your home, let one of us maybe come out and help you figure out how and where it might be good to consider putting rails. All right. Well, the past 20 months have not been much fun, have they? So much has happened with the COVID pandemic to restrict your mobility your social life, and your fun. And all of these might have increased your risk for falling. What can you do about that? Of course, you need to stay healthy, but don't stay still. Try to increase your social interactions, even if it's remote. Caroline referenced that um, being depressed can increase your risk of falling. And being able to interact with your family and friends is certainly going to help with depression. Try to take those opportunities to be more active when you do go out. Again, thinking about when you go to the doctor's office or to the grocery store or the dentist, can you park a little bit further away from where you would like to be? If you're really worried about how weak and um, deconditioned you've been due to the pandemic. Again, a physical therapy referral is ideal. We can help get you back on track. There are other factors that may change your risk for falling. As I said at the beginning, it's a bit of a moving target. They can occur if you have a change in your medications, if you've become sick or you've got an infection or a new pain. Some of these things, things set up that cycle of inactivity that Caroline showed us that graphic of, which can cause weakness, which makes you feel more inactive, which increases your risk for falls and so on and so forth. So if any of these things are occurring, then it's important to get help for that. If you need to use a walker or a cane, it's very important that you make sure it's the right size and the right type of walker for you. Fun fact, at least half of the people using a walker or a cane were never measured for it and were never trained how to use it. Did you know that John Wayne used his cane in the wrong hand? If any of you are house fans, Hugh Laurie, uses his cane in the wrong hands. I can tell you that's always a subject of conversation in any physical therapy clinic. Allow a physical therapist to help you with this. If you do move to a new home, 
that results in new challenges, new routines. And it's very important that you learn to learn your new environment safely. So those are just a few simple hints. I'm going to um, return now to Caroline and she's going to talk a little bit more specifics. So the next part of our talk after we've reviewed what might cause you to fall is if you have a fall. One thing I always like to tell my patients is once you've fallen, do not try to get back up right away. You want to stay still and do a self-assessment from the top of your head to the tip of your toes, thinking over every part of your body, making sure that nothing's hurt. If you feel pain or discomfort in a specific area that may be a major injury, do not attempt getting up. Call for help if needed. That may be a family member in the next room or 911. It is important to seek medical attention if you've hit your head, if you've lost consciousness, or if you feel like you've broken a bone. If it's a fall that you get up from with your own strength or assistance from a family, it is still very important that you report this to your doctor to keep record of what might be causing you to fall or how many falls you've had in a period of time. You want to make sure where you fell was not something environmental that caused you to fall. Is there something unsafe in that area that could lead to another fall? And a therapist can teach you, if you're not sure, how to get back up from any time that you've fallen. This is a lady here that's uh, showing a very simple way that Joe and I have both uh, taught many patients how to use a chair to get up. It's not something you need to do uh, frequently, but um, it's, it's easier to do than many think. This list here is just something to uh, keep in mind if you uh, go to the website and um, review over this uh, presentation. This list talks about all the things that you want to consider doing after you've have, had a fall. Just like Joe talked about, it's not required that you go and do all of these things right in a row the day after you fall. But you may want to check in on each of these bullet points to make sure that you are aware of what is causing you to fall or what could lead to another fall. So meeting with your doctor, having a proper exam, meeting with your pharmacist, potentially physical therapy, the eye doctor, the podiatrist, just having a list like this to refer back to when you have a fall so that you know you're making sure you're doing everything you can for the future. If you have um, a move to a new home or you want to stay in your home, which I want to reassure you, there is a lot of research that shows staying in your home, aging in place is what we like to refer to it as, is the best and um, most effective aging for everyone to be in a comfortable environment, to be with their family and friends. Uh, shows the best outcomes, the happiest life, the longest life. Um, and it's truly something Joe and I are very passionate about helping people to stay in their homes. Um, but something that might help you stay in your homes or keep your family um, less anxious is a fall alert system. I'm going to go through the four different types. We have them pictured here. Uh, you can consider any or all of these in combination or not. Um, the one that you might be most familiar with is this first one here. Um, it's the large receiver that some individuals have next to their phone. Uh, it's connected to a call center. You can have them located very conveniently in your home, as many of the receivers as you'd like. You might have a connected necklace to wear and you push that button on the receiver or the necklace anytime you experience a fall. The downside to these is that when you go out in the community, they're not with you or they don't work on the necklace per se. 
Um, and you also need to be awake. If you've fallen and hit your head and are unconscious, you might not be able to actively hit that button. There are systems like the GPS location system here on this app uh, in the next column that work outside the home. These are things, uh, these are devices that identify a call center again that a fall has occurred and they are using uh, Wi-Fi or LTE outside the home. They can give you a location of where you've fallen if you're not sure. Um, and they uh, are helpful that you don't have to wear something. It could be in your pocket uh, or your purse and uh, are able to go where you go. Another detection system here is one that you wear and actually identifies the fall for you. So these devices actually work based on gravity. And when it identifies a fall, it calls the center automatically for you. It's great for individuals that have cognitive impairment or are unconscious, like I spoke of earlier, or it may occur um, or it may call faster during the fall and get you help faster. They can be sensitive, so it might identify a fall that is not technically a fall or when you drop it. Um, but it's really helpful to make sure that anything, any time that you reach the ground or it reaches the ground, you're getting assistance from someone. Some alternative options that are not something you need to purchase separately. You can make sure that you always carry your cell phone with you, like I said, in your pocket, um, around your neck, or in your purse or walker bag. Uh, Apple watches are great. They can come, uh, they have GPS in them, um, or they can be taken without the phone a little distance away. So you can use that conveniently if something happens. Uh, baby monitors are great, even though uh, you could be in a different room, someone could be seeing you or listening that is away uh, within the home. And then um, always having a telephone in any of the rooms that you might go to frequently. I know uh, my own grandmother has a phone in her bathroom, her bedroom, her kitchen, her living room. Um, you can always carry the actual phone, but have the receivers in the other rooms as well. That would be similar to carrying your cell phone. Um, but just making sure you always have that line of communication if a fall occurs and you're away from your um, phone. Joe's going to finish up the talk for us. So just to wrap up, um, so we we'll hopefully have some time for a few questions. Um, you have the power to reduce your risk for falls and you have a whole team behind you. We've talked about your doctor, your podiatrist, your pharmacist, your physical therapist, your eye doctor, they're all there to help you. But you have your own superpowers here. Your superpowers are making sure that you take the full risk assessment or have a therapist do that with you, making sure you run through that home safety checklist or have a therapist help you with that and making sure that you are as active as you um, strong as you possibly can be. Just by increasing your leg strength, you're going to decrease your risk for falls. If you have a hard time getting up the stairs or getting on and off the toilet or in and out of a chair without using your arms, that's putting you at risk of falls. So you need to use that superpower of building your strength to, to be able to do those things. If you feel like your balance is a little bit off, perhaps you feel unsteady when you walk or you just seem to lose balance for no reason. Use that superpower of getting some balance assistance. Go and ask a physical therapist or join a class or speak to your doctor about how you can really harness those superpowers and stop your risk of falling. Decide what you want to tackle first. We've given you a ton of information today. You know yourself better than anybody else. 
So you've probably got a bit of an idea of what worries you. Is it your eyesight? Are you a bit worried about all those medications that you need to take? Are you worried about your feet? Or are you worried about your strength and balance? Choose one and address that, and then you'll find the other stuff will continue to follow. Don't put it off. Try to make a plan today. You're all hopefully a little bit energized having listened to this presentation. Try and decide on a goal and a follow-up plan after this talk today. For example, I'm gonna create that home safety checklist. Maybe I need to get that physical therapist out to give me some recommendations. I'm gonna complete that full risk questionnaire and then I'm gonna make an appointment to see my primary care doctor. Believe you me, a doctor would much prefer to do preventative work with you than have to deal with you being sick or injured and they will be able to guide you. No one gets stronger or improves their balance or fitness by sitting still. Movement is gonna help you and make you more powerful and safer. So don't forget, ask for help from the movement experts and that's your physical therapists. Thank you. We hope that you found this useful. Um, on the screen here is our contact information. You can always reach us through any of the ACAC physical therapy clinics. Um, Caroline and I are always out on the road, so uh, we tend to utilize our cell phones. And um, remember that the ACAC website is available and this presentation will be on that and that you will be able to um, listen to it again and then maybe take some notes as you go along. All right. And then on the next slide, I just have the references there of what we use today to get you some of this information. And we're going to see if we've got any questions. Um, and if All right, so um, no question, oh, there's a question. So the question um, is, what are the best soles since many stop people from not catching your foot on carpet and other floors? That's a very good question. Um, sometimes those very thick rubber soles feel like you're catching your feet um, instead of moving smoothly on that, on your feet. So. It really depends on how your walking pattern is. The most important thing is to make sure along with well-fitting shoes, you actually have the strength in your feet to be able to pick up your foot and have a normal walking pattern. Um, Caroline has got some experience working with patients with um, neurological conditions. Do you have anything else, Caroline, that you'd like to add about the right type of soles? It might not necessarily be the soles itself, like Joe was talking about in that slide, but making sure that the bones of your feet are supported. Um, so if there's any weakness in your feet that you might need an insert for, reaching out to a podiatrist is really helpful. Uh, that's um, something that we look for in shoes that might not come from a flip-flop or a slipper. Um, but when you feel like your feet are sticking in a heavier like tennis shoe, uh, that may come from higher up. It may come from your hips um, or even your core not being strong enough for you to walk, which would definitely benefit from a physical therapy assessment. And then I think there's an add on. Um, is it OK to walk around barefoot? We really don't recommend barefoot. If you remember back to the slide, we talk about the feet, um, unfortunately, losing some of their stability with the soft tissues and the bones. And a lot of us um, end up with our feet having decreased sensation. If any of you have got um, diabetes, um, you're going to put yourself more at risk of injury. So. 
um, a good fitting shoe should make you feel like you um, have that support without the clunkiness of a shoe. So it almost makes you feel like you're walking um, in bare feet, but generally it's not something that we recommend. We'll just give people a few more minutes to figure out that chat. And again, if you have questions um, and you um, want to ask them of us um, individually or schedule for us to come out and see you, um, we're, you'll be able to um, access um, our information and contact info um, another way. There's our emails again. We can keep those on the screen if you want to write them down. It is important to change your shoes frequently. Yes, it's just like the tires on our car. Uh, shoes are worn for a certain number of steps. And you can note that the tread on the bottom or the sole on the bottom wears away. That's our walking pattern. Everyone has their own walking pattern, like your fingerprint. Um, and if you find a good pair of shoes, you can buy that pair of shoes over and over and over. You don't have to reinvent anything or go out and purchase 10 types of tennis shoes, um, but you should change them often when they're not providing you the support that you felt when you first bought them. The, yes, so, and it is important as well um, that you're bending from your legs and not your back. Uh, that is an important lifting position just to protect our back. Uh, and if your legs aren't strong enough to bend down to pick something up, uh, it's important to make sure you're strengthening your legs. It could also cause you dizziness or a lightheaded feeling when you bend at your hips and come up quickly, which could lead to a fall. So the question is, rubber seems to work okay. So I guess it's man-made material or slippers, like you said, not to use. I think that's a very um, useful comment, yes. Um, the sturdy of the material is, it, it certainly is a better option. Um, I just wanted to add something else onto the shoes. Um, if you have a change, say for instance, you undergo a uh, total joint replacement, either a hip or a knee. Um, it's important then to change your shoes at that point after you've gone through a few weeks of rehab. That's because if you go back to your old shoes, they were using the wear pattern um, that you had when you before you had your joint replacement. And now you've got this new improved walking and safety. So you want your shoes to be able to continue to support that new joint. So don't go back to your new, your old shoes after your new joint. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Somebody said thank you. I don't know if the chat is available for all of you. So uh, but thank you very much for your uh, kind words. All right, we'll just give people a couple more minutes. We'll turn it back to Angela in case something comes in. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us. Um, again, I will be sending out... Um, to all of you who joined us, the link, um, as well as I will include Joe and Caroline's information again for you guys. And then also a link to some of the resources that they provided. Um, and other than that, you know, if you have any questions that come up, you know, after the presentation, you know, feel free to, to contact any, any of us. You also have my email um, and we'll be happy to get back with you. Um, so I think we will let everybody go and enjoy the rest of their afternoon and thank you again so much for for joining us. <laughs>